right. Let's get started. Mr. Daniel, if you'll put that up, we will. Nope, that's not the right one. You've got to go back two more. And back one more. Oh well, we will go to, to that one again. The song we're going to do tonight is, did not come out of the hymn book. Ooh, what us going to do? <laughs> this one is called The Lion and the Lamb. How many of you heard this song? If you don't listen to The Cross or The Hill or K-Love, you probably have not heard it. It is, we will go to the second one, Daniel. I skipped the first one already. Leland Mooring is the guy that wrote it. He was born in 1988. He is married to Michael W. Smith's daughter. How many of y'all know Michael W. Smith? Very well-known uh, contemporary Christian artist wrote uh, several songs that we do in the service. Um, he has, Leland has been nominated for four Grammys and eight Dove Awards as Artist of the Year, Album of the Year, and Song of the Year. But his recording of this song did not produce number one hit, did not produce any of these nominations for him. It was not until a group by the name of Big Daddy Weave. Now, who would have named their group that? Big Daddy Weave. They recorded it, and oh my goodness, did it become a major uh, chart-topping song on the Christian contemporary charts. Big Daddy Weave is also known for I Am Redeemed, and uh, Hugh has done that for us several times. Uh, overwhelmed, Jesus, I believe, and alive are uh, just four of the the major ones that they've done. But Lion and the Lamb and I Am Redeemed are probably the two most popular that they uh, the group has done. So we're going to look at this and see what it has to tell us. The first verse says, "He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down." Every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? How many of you got your Bible? We're going to need it. We're going to go doing a little traveling today. Let's start with Revelation 1 and verse 7. Revelation 1 verse 7. Does the Scriptures back up? What Leland has wrote here, he's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down, every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise, for who can stop the Lord Almighty? Revelation 1-7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is to be, amen. What does amen mean? So be it. So be it. Nothing can stop it. Uh, and then in Matthew, Matthew 24, and it's also in Mark 13, both Matthew and Mark uh, write these words. And then the sign of, it's in Matthew 24, 30. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And then Acts 1 and verse 9 through 11. And after he had seen these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky, while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you in heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. 
When did this happen? You remember Jesus died. He rose again. He appeared for, with them for 40 days. He ascended back into heaven. And they're looking at him as he is ascending. And the two men in white, two angels appear and say, Why are you looking? Why are you looking there? Do you think that we as a body of Christians find ourselves in this same way as they were, that we concentrate all of our time and energy on His return versus on why are you looking there when there's stuff to do right here. He's got something for us to do that is vitally important for the lives of lost people instead of us just putting all of our focus. Could you see, you know... Um, if the church just came together and we, we loaded up all the food and all the nutritional things that we'll ever need and we shut the doors and we just sit back and wait for Christ to come and get us. What kind of life would that be? You're going to have some Christians that say, you know, well, uh, I want to do that. That We don't worry about the world. No TV, no Facebook, no nothing. We're just going to sit back and we're just going to pray and be here and wait on... And that's not what he instructed us to do. That's not scriptural, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. Because he said, until I come again, he expects us to do something, okay? He gave us a command that says, I intend for, uh, when he told Peter, well, you're going to build my church on this foundation that they saw, the foundation of him being Born, living a sinless life, him dying on the cross, him born again. All, that was the foundation. He wasn't calling Peter the rock. He was saying that this is how I'm going to build my church, is the things that you believe. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So he tells us, until I come back, that's what you're supposed to be doing, is you're supposed to be building the kingdom of God. And... In large aspects, the church has done a good job about that because there is still a Christian body of people who are evangelizing and who are uh, praising Him and worshiping Him. So the church is still alive today. Certainly there's room for improvement, and we should be more concentrated on outside these walls than we are concentrated on inside these walls. Um, if you heard that phrase, we've got ours. You know, I know where I'm going. I don't know about that person outside. And as much as I've known y'all for all these many years, I can say that I feel sure that you will be in heaven too, but I can only answer about me. I can't 100% guarantee, uh, you know, that, that becomes true. I have seen church people that have been in the church for many years that wait for 25 or 30 years later to give their heart and life to Christ. There's an example right back there. So what we're in the business of doing, we got to keep doing. And today, uh, during our leadership meeting a while ago, uh, when Brother Eddie prayed, it, in, in both of those prayers, it reminded me um, this is the church that Satan's going to try to do as much as he can because the ones that ain't doing nothing, that's, that's a, a, I got that from Ogalusa. Ain't, uh, it transferred, yeah, rubbed off, Brother Mike's, uh, it, Satan's already got them, doesn't he? They're not doing anything. He ain't really worried about going over there. It's the ones who are doing something for Christ that he's going to try to come in and cause havoc and say, you know, i got to do everything I can to stop that. Because uh, if certainly he doesn't want us to be doing what God intended us to do. Any comments about that first verse? Uh-huh. Yes. Isn't that true? Yeah. Those that actually took him to the cross and put him to death. You know, the Roman soldier that was standing there when happened knew instantly that he really was who he was. But all of the others that had sent him, they're all going to witness 
exactly, this is what you did. You know, you saw it, and he was right there in front of your eyes the whole time. And why he was doing it was for you, you know. Uh, that, that's, that's a powerful part that I had not noticed either. Thank you. Nine. Good deal. Zechariah nine. All right, let's look at the second verse. Open up the gates. Make way before the king of kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Luke chapter four, in verse, starting in verse 17. Luke four. 17 through 19. And the scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to him. Who is the him? This is Jesus. He is in the temple. And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written. This is Jesus reading from the book of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who have been oppressed and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Jesus is sitting, standing in the temple reading about the very person that he was at that particular time. He is giving a testimony to who he is. Now we find that in Isaiah 61, 1. Let me read, or oh, oh, that's where, yeah, it's there. But let's keep on in Luke. And then, right after he read that, he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all the people in the synagogue were intently directed at him. Now he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all the people were speaking well of him and admiring the gracious words which was coming from him. And yet they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, No doubt you will, you will quote this proverb to me. Physicians, heal yourself. All the miracles that we've heard were done in Capernaum. Do here in your hometown, hometown as, as well. But he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his own hometown. Have you ever noticed that? That when we become a Christian, it's those that we are closest to that kind of doubt if we are real for real or not. Because they've seen us at our worst. And sometimes it is hard, uh, but living out that life in front of your family members and your friends will be the things that, um, that turn them around. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, and a severe famine came over all the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zareph in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many with leprosy in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogues were filled with rage as they heard the things that he said. And they got up and drove him out of the city and brought to him, brought him to the crest of the hill on which the city had been built so they could throw Jesus down before the cliff. But he passed through their midst and went, went about on his way. That last line, for who can stop the Lord Almighty? They had every intent to throw him off of the, the cliff in these passages in Luke. And Jesus just walked and made us and just got right around. And now they're like, oh, where to go? Where to go? It says he just went out among the, the crowds and and uh, <laughs> went on to the next city, and they, could, they couldn't find him. Nobody can stop the Lord God Almighty. No, crowds were just so big that they lost track of, you know, they, I'll tell them, the excitement, or we're going to throw him off, and all of a sudden they went and go, oh, my. He, he just <laughs> turned around and went behind this one, this one, this one, this one, walked this way, and all of a sudden they don't know where he is. <laughs> when you got thousands and thousands of people, they couldn't find him. 
Well, that's because Jesus went on about his business. He didn't have time for us. <laughs> you, know, you, you can't stop him. You can't throw him off the cliff. How many times did he get tempted? And how many times did, uh, did Satan even say, Hey, uh, you know, you can, you can stop this. You don't have to do all this. And Jesus was saying, No, no. You know, I, the whole intent, my whole reason for coming here is for these people and for you and I. And so you're not, Satan ain't going to stop. Nobody's going to stop the, the purposes that God has intended. The chorus. Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the lamb, the lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Philippians 2, verse 10 and 11 says, At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth out of that we were talking about a few moments ago. And that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We have many songs that talk about that, about every knee shall bow what a sight it's going to be when it happens. And every knee does, in fact, bow before him. Let's look at some of the facts about a lion, and let's compare that in, uh, to, to Christ. Some of the known facts is, is that a lion fears nothing. How does that relate to Christ? What does he have to fear? Absolutely nothing. Absolute, all powerful, all strength, all knowing. There is nothing in the, in, uh, the universe or the world or in, that he is afraid of. Hyenas is their enemy, their main, in, their only enemy. Who does that sound like in relationship to Christ? Who would be Satan? Satan, Satan okay? All right. Do what now? They do. They do. And Satan and his demons run in packs, don't they? Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, and then the lion watches over everything and everyone, so he maintains order. And how does that relate to Christ? He says he's got the whole world in the palm of his hand. He's orchestrating everything that's going on. Steve, Brother Steve Hale that was here a couple of weeks ago, his message spoke to me so well of what we're going through right now with this pandemic. None of this catches God off guard. I honestly believe that the activities of, of drastic weather that has not ever been seen to, these, to this kind of capacity and these pandemics, and it is God trying to get our attention. And uh, I, I believe that. And so therefore, yes, we need to take a stand. And yes, we need to, to pray. And yes, we need to. But more importantly, we need to know who's in charge and why is he doing it. He's doing it to get our attention. Not only the tension of those that are lost, but the church, that how serious it is for us to be about our business and do what he's telling us to do. And uh, so the order of everything that's going on is in his control. And he keeps, you know, there are people that, that will say, you know, well, we shouldn't go out and, and, and kill these beautiful beasts and all. They're... The order of everything, uh, our, when I was studying this, I read that a lion will even direct the lionesses that do all the hunting who and when and what to kill because you, you don't just go out there and kill everything. This is eating day. And then, uh, you know, they're, the grazing and to keep the order so that the live, the animals and all doesn't overtake a particular thing. And this next animal can't eat the grass because this animal did. Or, and all of that's in, in order. And the lion controls who's going to die to be eaten today and who isn't, you know. 
God is the same way. Uh, he is maintaining order. Sometimes His will is to take people home. Sometimes His will is to remain, remain here. And we need to, to understand, no, we don't need to turn around and say, well, it was part of God's plan. You're not God, you know. <laughs> and and they, a, a lost, I mean, uh, uh, someone that loses someone don't, don't really want to hear that from us. But they, uh, God, God is in control and He is maintaining order. All right, let's look at, that's some facts about the lion. Now let's look at the video that gives us some facts about the lamb. The Lamb of Christ, that is. Sometime well into the night of Thursday of Holy Week, the Savior was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, brought in chains down through the Kidron Valley, and then up to the upper city, to the home of the High Priest. The time is not recorded, but it most likely occurred sometime between 2 to 4 a.m. in the morning. Jesus has been awake for at least 20 hours and would not sleep again. To this point, he has prepared for the Passover, had his last supper with his disciples, suffered in Gethsemane, and then had been arrested by an angry mob. To say he is exhausted is putting it mildly. The scene of Jesus before the high priest and the Sanhedrin is a vivid image. Here the true high priest, Jesus, stands before the earthly established high priest, Caiaphas. This same high priest was in charge of all temple activity, in particular to this week of Passover, was the choosing and judging of the lambs to be slaughtered for the Passover feast. Each lamb had to be brought to the priest which was overseen by the high priest, Caiaphas, to be inspected so as to ensure that the lamb was without blemish. How ironic that the true lamb of God who would be slain for the sins of the world was now being judged by this same high priest, who for days now has been judging to determine if literally thousands of lambs were without blemish. Now before Caiaphas stood the true lamb who, prior to being sacrificed, was subject to that same law that prescribed the election of lambs for Passover. Yet, though he was truly the unspotted lamb, he was judged as being spotted. Though he was the very one who gave the law of Moses, he was now subject to his own law under the hands of wicked men. What great self-control Jesus showed here was true humility. He who was the creator of mankind now was mocked, spat upon, and buffeted by his very creations. Yet the scriptures state that he held his peace. When most men would revile against false accusations, Jesus held back. He knew that this was required so that we might be freed from spiritual bondage. For our sakes, he was bruised and scorned. How grateful I am that during all of these false accusations, Jesus did not think of himself but of us. How grateful I am that he went through what he did so that I might have life eternal. How grateful I am for the true Lamb of God, who on this night was judged of man as spotted, though he was perfectly unspotted in every way. What do you recall when the phrase lion and the lamb is mentioned? What, what comes to your mind? Weak and the strong joined together. Good point. Anything you recall from Scripture? Say it again. Okay. Okay. 
All right, good stuff. All right, let me get to the next one. Now, out to mention this, and let, let's look into it a little bit. Isaiah 11, 1 through 6. The wolf will lie with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, and the calf and the lion, and the, yield, yield, the little one, together, and as a little child, will lead them. Okay? Now, that is a prophetic word from Isaiah talking about the order of things in the second coming. Um, it even goes a little deeper and says that the wildlife that used to eat meat is going to change and they're going to, their diet's going to be grass. And that the animals will go, the children will be able to lead them, uh, you know, in, in different ways. Um, they're they're going to graze together and uh, talks about the, the, the serpent's food's going to be the dust. But there are groups of people and some people that have got that confused to a certain extent and they have in their mind that these are two total separate things that Jesus is the lamb and that Jesus is the lion and that there's going to come in time when you and I will bow before both that's not scriptural when we bow down before the lion, we are bowing down before the lamb at the very exact same time. It's not going to be we're going to walk over here and bow down to the lamb, then we're going to walk over here and bow down to the lion. It is saying, is, as Danny was talking about, is their roles at that time. And what the comparison of the, the role of the lion in normal structure today and the role of the lamb. But Jesus Christ is only one he is both of those things tied into one into, uh, purpose. Revelation 5, 5 through 6. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its, and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the th throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The Lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out unto all of the earth. It's referring here to Jesus Christ as the one, that in not, you know, uh, two individuals um, and... We will see and bow before an all-powerful and all-strengthening and all-maintaining uh, order, Jesus Christ, as we bow down as well to that compassionate, that tender, that gentle Savior who came into your heart and, and, and to mine and made uh, changes uh, to both of us. What, what a, a wonderful day that will be. I love the rest of the story, and this one is quite unique. Leland, these are his words. The chorus of this song first came after th about three years ago when we were leading worship at a church in California. Y'all shocked at the church? <laughs> anyway, uh, they was in worshiping Christ in a church in California for three days. The people coming to church were very hungry for God and were expectant. Did you come to church today expecting something? Over the last couple of weeks, it's been going through my mind and our heart. God has an intention of changing the life every time we assemble. If no heart is changed, if nothing happens, it is not God's fault. It is ours. It's the heart of the individuals that are taken. You and I should never come to church, no matter what spiritual condition we think we are in, and not learn and come away from here different. Than, there's something, there is some meat that we are to take back with us that we can apply in our spiritual life. When we get to invitation time, 
are we more focused on God save, God save, God save, that person that's sitting next to you? Wonderful thing to be praying. Are we absolutely uh, forgetting to acknowledge what's going on in our own life? Examine our own selves during those invitation times? I wonder why I remember back in the, the 80s and 90s when most of the time invitations, the altars were full. What has changed? And we've got in our mind that this is for somebody else. And Lord, and we do. We want people's heart to change and we want people to get saved. And you know, we hope that they all come down. But what if we did? If for no other reason but to pray for those that who have not. But are we that arrogant that something that was said and sung hasn't changed us? Isn't speaking to us that particular day? It doesn't have to be something I sing. It doesn't have to be something Brother Mike preached. Sunday school lesson. Something somebody said, Matt shook your hand at the door and it encouraged you in some kind of way. And God used that to put a positive message in your life. There are things going on or are we reacting to it? Or are we going through the motions? This particular time they were hungry and they were expecting things to happen. Every night got more intense than the other, and the expectations and the hunger grew. It was amazing leading a worship for them because none of them cared about us. They were just there for Jesus and pursuing Him. We sang two full-length songs and lots of spiritual songs, which means we were singing words that included holy and worthy. And we were singing them over and over again. He said, and the Bible talks about us singing spiritual songs that just comes from our heart. And he said, and all of a sudden, all of the people were singing holy and worthy and songs to Christ as if nobody else was in the room but them. Now, y'all, if we did that in a Baptist church, some of us going to say, I don't know what happened. But them people, they, they got the spirit. And I think they drank it before they walked in the door. <laughs> Do you remember the time our pastor challenged us to pray? And we all prayed on a Wednesday night. And we were all voicing out loud our own individual prayers. Were you here that night? Do you remember that sweet spirit that that was that night? To just hear, I had no idea what any of the others of y'all were saying. But to be able to hear a group of people praying to God, it, it was a very moving time. What would that be like if we did the same things? I've got to be honest, we have been singing some things the last couple of weeks that I've paid attention to, and I've even challenged y'all to clap with us, and I can barely get y'all through one verse before you stop clapping. And I don't understand why. Because I, if it's because we're doing such a wonderful job, you want to just sit there and listen to us, please don't. Tell us so we can mess up. You know, I, I would... I would much rather it be that all of us are worshiping together than us putting on a show. It shouldn't be that way. But I remember the times that we clapped. The whole, if the songs was upbeat and moving, we were clapping. If the songs were worshipful, we were praising. We had hands lifted and we, had, we were all singing. And I don't know, it, it may be me, y'all. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not saying... But it, it shouldn't matter the quality. It ought to matter the, the or not the quantity, it ought to matter the quality. What are the words saying? And what is the message saying to you? If you have victory in Jesus, shouldn't you be rejoicing because of that? And so here they, they were all... Um, they were not necessarily singing a written song, whatever come out of their heart. 
they were doing uh, what felt right to them and what was a offering to the Lord. Everybody was weeping, and there wasn't a dry eye in the room. My brother came to me and asked me to play the piano while he went down to pray for people. While I was there, God dropped the entire chorus of this song into my heart, and I pushed my phone and sang and, re and uh, recorded the chorus right there sitting at the piano during that time. He's sitting there playing, and he, the Lord puts it, and he sings the whole entire chorus. Just from that particular, it was not until two years later that he assembled two friends of his together, and they wrote the verses to it. But the chorus came all at one time while he was witnessing, and he could, out of confidence, say, nothing can stop the Lord God Almighty. Yes, everybody was bowing down and everybody was worshiping. And he was saying, even outside this room, everybody is going to bow down and worship. And the Lord gave him that whole entire chorus sitting right there. What a powerful message. All right. Play it, Mr. Daniel.
You know, they called the lion the king of the jungle for a reason. And they call the Lord Almighty the lion for a reason. He can fight your battles much better than we can. And uh, so at the challenges you're facing day to day, let, let the lion take it. Let him do what you and I never could or can't. Um, any comments? We'll forgive you. <laughs> yeah, you got the right, yeah. He could have said it's in the Bible. And we did, yes, sir. <laughs> All right, let's stand together. Danny, will you pray for us, please, sir?